I'm General Mark Milley, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and this year we commemorate the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. From 1939 to 1945, a global great power conflict raged as more than 30 nations fought a total war. The United States alone battled through 44 campaigns across 10 theaters, including operations in China, Burma, and India, and Southeast Asia. The biggest air and naval operations in military history while island hopping across the vast Pacific. And of course, major land, air, and sea operations in the Atlantic, Europe, and Italy, along with North Africa and the Middle East. In the end, 80 million people were killed in the costliest war in human history. However, amidst the destruction, the death, the bloodshed, patriots of the greatest generation took up arms against tyranny to fight for something greater than themselves. They fought to defend America and achieve a better peace. And through their sacrifice, they established a rules-based global international order rooted in political and economic liberty that has maintained great power peace for over seven decades. Now, through the efforts of the American Veterans Center, we have a rare opportunity to have conversations with our greatest generation. Over the course of six episodes, the American Veterans Center will feature a series of conversations with American living legends of World War II. We will hear from heroes like Lieutenant Colonel Harold Brown, a famed Tuskegee Airman who was shot down over enemy territory. We'll hear from Bill Norberg, a sailor who was stationed on board the USS Enterprise from the first day of World War II until the last. And we're going to hear from Woody Williams, a Marine who received the Medal of Honor for his heroic actions in the bloody Battle of Iwo Jima. And we'll also hear from Ray Lambert, a decorated Army combat medic who stormed the beaches of Normandy. And we will hear of countless other acts of valor from Midway to Omaha Beach. So on behalf of the 2.3 million soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen that are serving today, we extend our sincerest thanks to the greatest generation for granting us the gift of freedom and proving once again that we are the land of the free because we are the home of the brave. Thank you, and God bless America. Hello, I'm Admiral Tom Fargo, the 20th Commander-in-Chief of United States Pacific Command, and welcome to our conversation on Midway and Beyond, the Naval War in the Pacific. Our conversation is presented by the Americans Veterans Center and the United States of America World War II 75th Commemoration. We're honored by being joined by two veterans of the epic Battle of Midway. And certainly Ed Fox and Bill Norberg uh, saw a tremendous amount of the, the war in the Pacific, starting at Midway and, and all the way through uh, to Iwo Jima. They had uh, obviously two very different perspectives, uh, Ed on the ground and, and Bill at sea on, on Enterprise. And with that said, let me, let me start with Ed and let him introduce himself and talk a little bit about his experience in the Pacific in World War II. Good afternoon, sir. Pleasure to meet you and everybody else. Um, I joined the military actually in 1939 um, after the Pan A was sunk. Uh, I was very young, but um, I would, couldn't understand why we didn't respond right away. But it took me quite a while to get from the National Guard into the Marine Corps in 1941. Um, from Camp Pendleton when the war broke out, we were surprised, obviously. Um, I was sent on to um, Midway, but before that, uh, on the way off, out to Midway, uh, the scuttlebutt aboard ship was that we're going to, to Wake Island, which fortunately did not prove out too well. When we got to Hawaii, uh, we did see Pearl still burning, 
uh, we try and recovery the battle, the battle uh, bodies. Um, not a word was spoken aboard the ship when we pulled into port. We were there a couple of days and I went on to Midway. Um, the day that we landed, um, Japanese sub surfaced and shelled the island. I eventually moved on to the resort that you see behind me. And there I spent uh, from January to August. We had um, Bob Ware across the front of us that we uh, put in ourselves. We had Constantinas that we rolled and put in the surf and fought the Portuguese man of war. Um, I had a 30 caliber water cooled machine gun for World War I. Um, our entertainment was the Goody Birds and um, Crystal Sets. And the, the only radio station we could pick up from the United States was uh, the border station out of Del Rio, Texas and uh, Tokyo Rose. Tokyo Rose uh, played the music we liked and the antennas for the crystal set had to come down during the morning hours because of the birds flying. Um, I spent the entire attack, attack on Midway in that bunker that you see. They did not want us to be revealed, I guess. And it wasn't until after the planes left, after that 17 minutes on June the 4th, that we were allowed to go to our any aircraft position. And that was just a hole in the ground with a pedestal where we mounted the machine gun and waited. And after one year of training, I felt kind of irritated that the Japanese didn't come back. Uh, it was communication, obviously, it was very poor to us. We did not know about the aircraft carriers going down. And it was not until after research that I made after the war that I found out how well protected we were. And I admire the United States Navy Torpedo Squadron 8 and the Marines and, di and Navy dive bombers that took off the aircraft carriers. Had not been for them, I wouldn't be talking to you today. Thank you, sir. You know, uh, I know you were constantly worried about uh, an invasion because that was certainly the pattern of activity of the Japanese at that point in time. Uh, but I, I also know, I guess there were submarines out there too, right? And they would surface at night and uh, bombard the island? Yes, and near my gun position, I didn't particularly care for it, but we had a searchlight. And whenever the radar picked up a signal, why well, we could hear we could hear the engines of the compressor, of compressor, of the generator starting up. And we knew darn well there was going to be something going to happen in front of us. And uh, if I was on patrol near that light, well, I immediately left that area right off the bat. Um, but they did service this side of the horizon and uh, shell three or four rounds and then get out of there. But uh, I can't say it happened often. It happened frequently, but not very often. They never did hit anything. Wow. Uh, hey, Bill, what was, uh, what was it like being on the other side of this uh, at sea during that uh, period of time? I know that, of course, Enterprise is uh, probably the most famous aircraft carrier in, in naval history uh, and made 20 of the 21 engagements in the, in the Pacific. Uh, tell us a little bit about what it was like being at sea during that period of time. I'd like to go back just a little bit further, if I might. We were due to be in port on December the 6th, 7 o'clock in the evening, uh, and a bad storm held us up. So we had to refuel our destroyers, which had been running awfully low on diesel fuel due to that terrific storm. And that delayed our arrival into Pearl Harbor by about 12 hours. If, it, if that hadn't happened, of course, we'd, be, we'd have been the number one target in the Japanese gun sites, and we'd have been the number one ship to have been sunk with the loss of about 23, 2400 people. Uh, but uh, heaven was on our side that day, I must say. Uh, and our first actual 
meeting of Japanese happened on February the 1st, 1942. And we went out uh, as a, 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 group, a, a task force, task group of, of which we were one. And uh, we were attacking the Marshall and the Gilbert Islands. And we gave them a pretty good pasting as well as along with, as, as well as the Yorktown, which is, was along with us to some extent. And of course, we got the rousingest welcome you could imagine coming back into Pearl Harbor because that had been nothing but doom and gloom uh, after the uh, Japanese attack on the island there. And uh, I think we were able to lighten the hearts and minds of the United States as a whole because the attack on the Marshall and the Gilbert Islands made headlines all over the, all over the country, maybe all over the world, I'm not sure. As I say, our very, fir my very first sight of the Japanese was on February 1st when we attacked the Marshall and Gilberts and five Japanese bombers as we were heading out from the, those islands came and attacked us and only one of them really pressed his attack in and I, I call him the first kamikaze. The note that title had never been invented at that time because he was trying to ram, ram into our ship and do all the damage he could. But he flew over our uh, port stern and there was a, a young gentleman aboard ship there that hopped into the uh, back of a, an SPD, strapped himself to the 50 caliber machine gun and extended his greetings to that Japanese pilot. And that Japanese pilot came in and sheared the very tail off the, off the plane he was sitting in. And at that very same time, the captain said, hard right runner to starboard. See to starboard? Yeah. And uh, as a result of that, the plane fell into, it fell into the water. Uh, so we went, we went to, uh, Jimmy Doolittle raid accompanying the Hornet. And then came the Battle of, Battle of Midway. We missed, by the way, we missed the Battle of the Coral Sea by one day. I'm sorry, we missed that. But anyway, then the men came Midway and we were one, two carriers going out to sea. And all of a sudden, a third carrier showed up on the horizon, the Yorktown, which had been badly damaged in the uh, Coral Sea fight, supposed to take three months to repair it, was miraculously repaired in about three days or patched up at least to the extent that it was survivable. And it joined us. So that kind of evened the odds a little bit, four carriers for them, three carriers for us. And I think we had almost approximately the same number of fighter planes and bombers and target, uh, torpedo planes. We woke very early the morning, the morning of June the 4th and uh, the pilots started revving, revving up their engines bright and early. The torpedo planes took off. They arrived just a little bit ahead of our bombers and they definitely arrived before the Enterprise fighters because the Enterprise fighters disappeared somewhere and the on Hornet fighter, fighters came in to help protect our torpedo bombers. But th there was not much protection that prevailed, however, as the Hornet lost all of their planes. We lost all but four of ours. And I think the Hornet or the Yorktown lost all but two of theirs. Very, very few of the people survived that that were belonged to the torpedo squadrons. As the day, as the day progressed, we, we uh, I uh, was on the bridge and uh, we got reports occasionally from the uh, damage that was being inflicted on the Japanese fleet. And of course, when the planes were returning to land after that long flight that they made, there were very few of them coming back. 
as compared to the ones that went out. And of course, that was not a very happy day for us. There were, you know, we were obviously very fortunate that Admiral Halsey and all of the carriers were at sea on December 7th. Otherwise, we'd have had nothing to fight with at, at Midway. And, uh, and I think we, we got a little lucky too, didn't we? Uh, we got lucky kind of finding the, uh, the Japanese fleet uh, moving to uh, Midway. And we got a little lucky catching the Japanese carriers changing their armament in the, in the middle of our attack. And also the Japanese fighter planes were down there taking, doing a job on the torpedo planes, which nicely left the scout bombers free of about 10, 12, 14,000 feet un, unhindered at all on their uh, run in to make their bombing attack. And it was a real, real cleanup job that they did. I believe the Enterprise got credit for not downing two and a half carriers and the Yorktown one, one and one and a half. Uh, and all in all, it, it was a successful day, but by the same token, we didn't like to see the loss of all those planes and pilots and radio men. It was an amazing uh, battle and of course, uh, one that uh, we believed uh, changed the, uh, the course of the war. Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Ed and, and you, we'll start with Ed. Uh, uh, did you sense this was, uh, this was a turning point in the war or was uh, everybody kind of head down and tail up uh, worried about the next battle and uh, that you couldn't gain that perspective? I think uh, we did not realize it at the time um, that this was a turning point. Communication was nil coming down to us. It wasn't until I left the island and headed home that I realized what had happened. Um, news um, just wasn't put out to, the, to us there on the island. I think the higher echelon knew that the Japanese were now fleeing, but as for myself down here as a grunt, why uh, we did not realize that. And, um, oh, it wasn't until I got to Hawaii and headed home that I knew then that all the carriers were got, shut down and that um, there were other elements that made a big difference in the island. Bill, any, any sense that this was, uh, this was going to change uh, the war at Midway? Well, I, I'm going to disagree with a whole lot of people who felt that this was the turning point in the war. I think the great turning point in the war was, excuse me, let me back up a bit. This was primarily engagement. And a few months later came the engagement. We were defensive on the first portion, and then we went on the offensive as the land uh, battle took place on, on Guadalcanal. And when the Japanese were defeated at Midway, and again defeated at Guadalcanal, I and many others decided right then and there, this is very sig a very significant part of our winning the war eventually. That's a great perspective. Uh, I think that there's, a, there's a lot more to talk about in the war in the Pacific, and, but I don't want to miss the opportunity for the midshipmen to get a chance to ask some questions. So I'm going to start with... Uh, with Jacqueline from the United States Naval Command. And Jacqueline, would you uh, ask your questions to, uh, your question to Ed and, and Bill? Yes, sir. First, thank you gentlemen for sharing your stories. I really appreciate all the insight that you offer, have offered us today. Um, mine is tailored more to speaking about um, your perspective regarding your experiences. So af after spending four years at the Naval Academy, we get to spend time talking to officers and senior enlisted leaders. And the common theme that I've learned in every conversation I've had is that there's always a lesson to be learned and a memory to be remembered in every moment that you lived. During your time in the Battle of Midway, what was your favorite moment and what was your most frightening moment and what lessons did you learn from those? I can't think of any. I probably will tomorrow or tonight, but. Um, we were pretty cocky. We 
we were untried, we were not tested. Um, just bring them on, you know, we'll do our job. Um, even when the sub surfaced and fired, uh, it didn't bother us. Um, you know, I don't think frightening was the, be any element to bother us too much. As far as, what was the other portion of it? It was the following part was, what was the lesson that you learned from it? What was I learned from it? Is that correct? Yeah, the lesson lessons learned from your time on Midway. Uh, the, well, I guess we worked together. Somebody always covered my back. I covered theirs, um, re regardless of branch of service. Um, I admire the people that did what they did that particular day. Of the 57 planes that left Eastern, only five returned. Uh, none of them were any of my friends. Um, you know, we just did a job, that's it. You know, it's, it, it does point out uh, what we all know. It's, it's why we have a young military, right? Because uh, your attitudes and your strength and your, uh, your conviction that, uh, uh, that you could stand together and win this thing was uh, hugely important to your success. Thank you, sir. Bill, any other thoughts on that question? Well, the question, original question was, what was your scariest moment? Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Well, I actually had no scary moments there. The, the Enterprise, the ship was not under attack at that time. And uh, so we had no reason to even think about being scared. And I, I'd like to follow up on that some other, some other section of the interview here about being scared or not being scared. Let's, uh, let's move on to another question since, uh, like I said, I want to give everybody a chance to participate here. Um, I see we've got, uh, we got Joseph uh, from Penn State University as an NROTC midshipman. Uh, Joseph, what's your question? First, I wanted to start off and say thank you very much, Bill and Ed, for sharing your stories. It is an honor to hear them. Um, Bill Norberg, uh, you were stationed on the USS Enterprise from the first day of World War II until the very last day. And doing so, you worked under nine different commanders uh, just on that ship. Um, Mr. Ed Fox, you have worked under a multitude of commanders as well. Since you've seen many types of leaders, um, in your opinion, what is the best type of leadership style? And is there something that something specific that one of your leaders uh, has done that still sticks to you this day? Well, let me jump up one step ahead of the commanding officers, one step higher, that would be Admiral Bull Halsey. He was aboard our ship for the first, se first several months the war started and should have been on there longer, but he got sick, had the shingles or something like that. But anyway, he was full speed ahead at every, every possible turn. Hit him and hit him and hit him again. And uh, that's the leadership that I liked the best and had the most confidence in. But we had a, a couple of very quiet commanding officers, particularly one named uh, Cato D. Glover. He very calmly and efficiently handled the situation no matter what it was and had the respect and admiration of the entire crew. And that happens to be the commanding officer that I felt the most comfortable with while doing my duties. You know, I think it points out, uh, Joseph, that there's a, there's a lot of different leadership styles. And uh, of course, uh, they can, uh, most of them can be effective. Uh, and it, it's got to be a leadership style that fits your personality and that uh, is kind of true to yourself. So um, it's a great question and a, a great answer from, from Bill. Uh, Ed, anything to add to that? About leadership? No. Um, seldom ever saw our commanding officers. Um, mostly dealt with either the first sergeant, the platoon leader, um, the young lieutenant that was just learning. Um, but 
our command uh, structure was such that I wasn't too worried about them. They did a good job. Tell me what you learned from the gunnery sergeants. You probably had a lot more contact with them. Well, I know that they know how to chew. <laughs> um, we had a very experienced gunny. Um, I was learning things from him that probably only grandfathers are able to tell you. But uh, he was a die on the wool Marine all the way back. His family was in the Marine Corps. And he was had hash marks down to his ankles. <laughs> no, they held the place together, the gunnies did. They're like the field first. Yeah, I'm I'm sure they did. And and you know, those those gunnies trained uh, uh, all of you. Uh, so that uh, you could fight effectively. And, and I'm sure they, they saved thousands upon thousands of lives because they were, they were tough uh, in a, an effective and demanded a, a high standard from all of their Marines. So, uh, okay. Well, how about uh, Miami University, our Naval ROTC unit there? Michael, what's your question? Interestingly enough, you like asked my question to a T earlier with the turning point of the war. But uh, I have I have another question. So um, I'm a political science major here at Miami and I've spent a lot of you pretty much the last three years looking at political unrest and discourse in the United States and basically like the country being united under one flag. And for the like we studied it and the last time the United States was ever fully united on anything was basically World War II. When Pearl Harbor happened, the entire country was united under this. I know Ed had mentioned it earlier, but perhaps you guys could elaborate on more on like what drove you guys to join the military, serve the country, and if you guys came from perhaps military families or had military backgrounds from the past. Oh, I was already in the service. I had ROTC in high school in Chicago. Um, members of the ROTC as a freshman, they'd be commissioned in the ROTC. Um, and that was mainly because I'd already been in the National Guard. Um, I'd hate to say that our war was a popular war, but uh, everybody was behind us. We'd come home I, on a furlough. Um, car dealers would give me a car for a month. People would arrive with gas coupons to give to me. Um, my parents got sugar. Um, the attitude was altogether different than I have to say today, but um, we're in it together, everybody. And I don't know if that covers your question as far as politics go, but um, from right on down to Washington, D.C., down to the lower manway, we were all there. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Ed. My, my mother was a Navy nurse in World War II, and uh, she said that when you walk the streets of San Francisco, uh, there wasn't uh, a male between the age of 18 and 50 that wasn't in uniform during that period of time. Yeah. So, Bill, your perspective? A couple of years before you young folks were born, actually in 1933, Admiral Richard Byrd came back from a adventure he had down in Antarctica. And he appeared at the little town in Illinois where I lived and gave a rousing talk. And I had Navy in my mind very specifically at that time. And then in January of 1941, a young friend of mine lived right across the street from me, came home from the Navy, wearing a brand new Navy uniform and looked spick and span. And he told me that it was a possibility for me to go to communications school out in San Diego if I joined the Navy. And by gum, I had a sister and an aunt and an uncle living in San Diego. So that inspired me a little bit further. And I signed up in February of 41 to join the Navy. Uh, I wasn't particularly interested in going into the, into the Army. And they didn't have an Air Force. They had air, air, something was part of the army at that time. So I chose the Navy and I was very happy to have done that. 
Thanks, Bill. You know, before we move on to uh, the last question from uh, the midshipman, uh, I think we ought to talk a little bit about the the rest of the war after Midway. And and Ed, I was particularly interested in uh, in Iwo Jima, and uh, of course it was a, a not only a dramatic battle but a huge loss of of life. And I know you were in the third wave uh, going ashore. Could could you talk to that a little bit, please? Well, I was ashore going ashore with several members of my team. That were, I was an FO, forward observer. Um, going into the island line, that's something else that's hard to explain. Um, you're, just, you're just glued into what your mission's going to be like, and that's all you're thinking about. Get on, get on, get on land and... Uh, cuss the coxswain out for not putting you in dry land and have to wade in. Um, once on board uh, or once on land, why I try and find your unit. And the first night, why I couldn't find him. Um, I picked a shell hole and got in a shell hole. They, didn't, they wouldn't hit the same hole twice. But I spent the first night on the island in the shell hole. Um, I realized then how fortunate I was on Midway because had one shell landed above my position, it would have covered up the port. No rocks, no hard surface. Um, I do compare Iwo with Midway, how lucky we were on Midway. But uh, after the first night on Iwo, I finally got together and we joined a team that was going up the side of Suribachi. Since I was an FO team member, uh, we wanted to get an OP on top. A um, couple of nights going up the side of the mountain, my hand grenades would be rolled down upon you. And you hope that they, it wasn't the time that when they rolled by you that they didn't go off. Um, once on top of uh, the Suribachi, we began to set up our OP position, and that was the fifth day, and that's when they raised the flag. Uh, we kind of ridiculed and razzed the team of the 28th Marines for being gung-ho carrying up a flag, not realizing the significance of what was going to happen with that flag today. Um, but we were on top of the island for about three days. Uh, spotting targets came down and then joined the 27th Infantry uh, Regiment. And um, I stayed in the line for 36 days. And of the 12 members of our original team, I was four of us were able to walk off that island. But they were built in, well, they were dug in. I'm sure there's some still buried there that we never will find. Yeah, I, I know my, I went to Iwo as the uh, Pacific commander and the uh, the extensive cave network uh, all dug in. I mean, people actually below the ground that could come up and, uh, and attack you at any point in time. And you, as you point out, there are probably people that are still buried in, in those caves. So uh, thanks very much. That, You're welcome, sir. Pleasure. Really appreciate that insight. Um, Bill, Enterprise obviously yes. failed uh, uh, across the Pacific, through the Central Pacific, and was involved in all those battles. What was the most memorable after that? I think well, there were two most memorable moments. <clears throat> the first one was in August 24th of 42, when we were outside of the uh, Guadalcanal, supporting the landings and uh, the, uh, protecting the Marines ashore there. And uh, we, we, that was our baptism under fire. And uh, some of the folks told me at, later they were scared to death. And I, I just do not remember being scared in spite of the, having, uh, I think there were 72 bombers that attacked the Enterprise alone on that one day. And uh, but I was so determined that I was going to do the job I was supposed to do. And I depended on everybody else to do the job they were supposed to do and didn't have time to be scared at that moment. If there was any scared, 
It was after that battle. And we got pretty badly hit on that day. And our damage control personnel were so effective that we were back operating, I think maybe an hour and 40 minutes later, in spite of all the problems that we had. For instance, we had a 12 square foot gash in the hull of the ship and thousands and thousands of gallons of water were pouring in and our damage control people were able to resolve that problem in, in pretty short order. Our starboard rudder got caught at a 20 degree angle and we were traveling around in circles and a flight of 36 Japanese bombers was approaching us and our damage control people were able to resolve that problem in time. And we ducked into a, uh, a little bit of a rain shower that which was so prevalent in, in the Pacific and they missed us by 50 miles. The second event was on October 26th of 42 and that was the Battle of Santa Cruz. And I'll just mention one thing here. Uh, after the main portion of the battle was over with, uh, we'd been hit by three times with different, with bombs and many near misses. And then the Japanese torpedo planes came in and they should have been in on a coordinated attack with the bombers, but somehow or another things got followed up. But anyway, that was the most thrilling, if you might call it, time of my life, watching those Japanese planes headed towards me launching torpedoes toward me and uh, wow. wondering what is going to happen. Well, what happened was we had a Captain O.B. Hardison there whose head was way, way, way up in the clouds most of the time. And somehow or another, he escaped whatever it was, either six or nine torpedoes. Nobody's ever been able to determine that with some very deft maneuvering. And I'm thankful to him today for that. Well, that's an amazing story. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got time to, for one more question from uh, our midshipmen. So let's go back to the Naval Academy. And uh, uh, Mitchell, you're up. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, I just wanted to thank you guys so much for uh, talking to us. Uh, you know, you guys really have inspired me to, uh, to serve my country as well. And, uh, I can't thank you guys enough for, you know, doing your part in, in that great war and making sure that we're not speaking, you know, Japanese or, or German right now. So, um, anyways, my, uh, my question is for, uh, Mr. Norberg, uh, sir, was there anything specifically about the crew of the USS Enterprise that made them such a tenacious fighting force? If there was, could you speak to the specifics that set the crew? of the USS Enterprise apart from the other naval ships during the time? Well, I did not, did not serve aboard any other ship in the Navy, even though I was on the USS Constellation for a couple of weeks and while in training. But I got aboard the ship in September 12th of 40, 41, I think it was, and they were uh, getting ready to do some gunnery drills. And uh, we went out to sea and I observed the gunnery drills and the ships taking off and landing. And I saw how precise they could be. And all through the war, we just had an amazing, amazing morale. People wanting to be, uh, help each other. And I think that is a, to a great extent, the success of the enterprise. You know, I'd like to just acknowledge uh, uh, Dylan Minch from Vanderbilt. Uh, he's actually on the on the call, has some technical difficulties, which uh, often happen here, and so won't be able to ask a, a question. Uh, but uh, uh, another midshipman that's part of our great ROTC units throughout uh, the nation. Uh, Ed, any any final thoughts here uh, about your time in the Pacific and? in the war? Well, not back then, but I have to admit that I go back every year, most every year, before the 
epidemic that we're going through now uh, by as, as a guest, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who maintains the memorial on Midway Island. Um, we have a service, anniversary service each year on the 4th of June, and it's conducted by the members of Fish and Wildlife Service, um, often escorted from Honolulu to the island by uh, Gulf Stream. Um, I have a guardian that takes care of me, like the trips I'm off uh, duty from Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to take care of, uh, of all my needs. Young lady has done that several times. Um, remarkable. Um, people here in town uh, provide air travel for me. Um, there are many, many people that, like you all around the table today, uh, remember us. And I think that's important. Um, otherwise, they're going to forget. So, a lot of people out there um, will comment about my hat that I wear. And it's what's in, inspiring sometimes when you're out a <clears throat> grocery store in a checkout lane and there's a little boy in a cart in the next lane spot you and he salutes. So that tells you something about his family. Yeah, it does. You know, uh, Midway is a national treasure, Ed, and um, I'm really glad you've had a chance to uh, to go back there. Uh, it, uh, uh, it's an amazing place and, of course, a big part of our, our history. Um, and I'd like to thank you both uh, for participating today. Ed, you you bring up a point that I, I think is the very essence of, of why we're here today, and that is to make sure that uh, this history and these stories and the uh, dedication and sacrifice of, uh, of, of your generation uh, isn't lost on anybody uh, for eternity. And uh, we'll make sure that uh, this particular session gets the widest possible distribution because uh, uh, what you have related to us today is, uh, is, is hugely important to our future. So uh, let, me, let me thank you both. Let me thank uh, all of the midshipmen uh, for participating. And on behalf of uh, the American Veterans Center, uh, let me thank you both personally, uh, Ed Fox and Bill Norberg for, for joining us on this, this very special occasion. And uh, It's an honor uh, to be here, sir. Great to have you. It, sir. Bill, wonderful, yes. to, wonderful to meet you both and, and get a chance to talk to you. And uh, I look forward to our next conversation. Thank, thank you, you all very much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us.